When I was a, a kid, my favorite word was mystery. Love that word. And for a while, when I, was in, when I was in grade school, if you would have asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you that I wanted to be a mystery Arthur. Now, I meant author, but that, that sounded like a made-up word to me for some reason when I was six or seven, so I just kind of went with the name that I knew. Mostly, I loved the idea that there were things in this world that were unknown that were mysterious, unknowable. That was good news to me. And I like to write, so the, kind of, the, the two things kind of came together. As I look back now, I'm not so sure that I didn't find my way into being a mystery Arthur after all. Because I get to write about and talk about the biggest mystery of all. As a pastor and a preacher, I get to uh, uh, talk about God, who is oftentimes described, sometimes described as the ineffable. I don't know if you've ever heard that word. This could be a vocabulary word for you today. It means basically indescribable, undefinable. God is not something that you can put into a box. God is not something that you can describe, describe in 25 words or less. The only way to experience the mystery of God is through faith. When I was a, a senior at, at Culver Stockton College, I was a, a philosophy and a religion major, and I did my, uh, my senior research paper. Uh, it was a requirement in everybody's major at that time. I did my senior paper on something, it was called Mystical Experience in the Religious Consciousness, which is really just a fancy way of describing what happens when we experience God. What is that? What's all, all that about? Now, I've already mentioned one aspect of that, ex of that experience, and that is ineffability, which is, again, it, it, just the fact that it can't be described. But when mystics really try to ex describe what they've experienced, there's two things that they always talk about. Two things that, that are almost always going to be a part of, of a mystical experience, and that is unity. The, the sense of oneness, the oneness of all things, and love. In other words, when you have an ex, a, a mountaintop experience of God, what you're most likely to report afterwards is the sense that everything is connected. Everyone is connected, and that everything is surrounded and filled and empowered by divine love, by God's love. On Wednesday night at Bible study, we went through uh, Psalm 136, which is also known as the great Hallel. And that's a Hebrew word that means praise. And, uh, and this is, a, this is a, a, a responsive psalm that is used by, uh, by Jewish congregations and Jewish families at Sabbath worship and, uh, and at Passover celebrations. It's 26 verses long. And it tells the story of God's activity through history. From creation to uh, God taking the people of Israel out of, of Egypt in the Exodus to their conquest of the promised land under Joshua. And the way it's used in worship is that the leader will say the first part of the verse. And then the congregation or the family, whoever's there responds with the, the refrain, the second part of each verse, which is, for his steadfast love endures forever. So 26 times that refrain is repeated, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Bible is, is clear, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that at the heart of everything is God's abiding and enduring Love. His steadfast love endures forever. We read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. So that's a message. It's an essential message. It's a message that the world, I believe, both wants and needs to hear. The Bible is God's love letter to the world. God loves us even in our brokenness, even in our sin. It's something we should never stop talking about. 
It's that important, that essential. Unfortunately, however, the church hasn't always done the best job of communicating that message. Sometimes we come off as, as judgy and exclusive and anything but loving. And there are consequences for that in terms of our mission, in terms of our ministry. Occasionally, I get contacted about doing a funeral or a memorial service for, for somebody that doesn't have any ties to a church. And, uh, and oftentimes, in a situation like that, they'll tell me that they don't want a religious service. And, uh, and, and I'm always like, you, you realize I am the pastor of a Christian church, right? I don't know how to do a service that's not a religious service. I wouldn't even know where to begin. But I, I get it. I, I get what they're saying. What I figured out a long time ago is, is that what they're really saying is that they don't want to feel shamed. They don't want to feel judged. They don't want to feel condemned. They're grieving. They've lost a loved one. They don't want an altar call, which I, I don't do anyway at a funeral. Whether they realize it or not, what they want and need to hear is that God loves them. They need to hear how God walks with them in their grief. How God can be a source of, of, of comfort and peace and hope. And so that's what I talk about. And I tell them ahead of time, that's what I'm going to talk about. I've done hundreds of funerals, and many of them for folks that don't really want a religious service. And I've never once had a complaint. I have had people come start coming to church, though. It works. It's powerful. It's necessary. It's who we are. God is love. It's at, the, it's at the heart of everything that we stand for and everything we believe. As many of you have heard me say before, the Bible is a love story that begins with a divorce. A broken relationship. And the Bible is the story of God seeking to restore that relationship. Seeking to reconcile that relationship. And he tries in lots and lots of different ways. As we read a couple of weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son. In other words, God's love became incarnate in Jesus. As the hymnist Christina Rossetti wrote in 1885, love came down at Christmas. Jesus is the visible presence of the invisible God. As Paul writes in Colossians, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven by making peace through the blood of his cross. Now, our scripture reading for today is from the opening verses of John's gospel. Something that's interesting that a lot of people, I think, don't realize is that unlike Matthew or Luke, uh, John doesn't include anything about the nativity. Nothing about the details of Jesus' birth that are familiar to us in Matthew and Luke. What he does do, though, is remind us that Jesus is the Word, capital W, made flesh. And that he came to bring light into our darkness. So we're going to take a look at John chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And of course, he's talking about John the Baptist here. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. 
And the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. That last sentence is, I think, probably one of the most amazing sentences ever put to paper. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The creator of the universe, the intelligence behind the world as we know it. The loving mystery at the center of everything took the form of a human baby. Pretty amazing. Charles Wesley, who wrote Christmas carols like the one, one we sang today, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, described the incarnation in one of his hymns. And I'd never seen this line before, but it really struck me this week. Our God contracted to a span incomprehensibly, mysteriously, made man. Nowadays, we don't use the word span to describe a, a, a unit of measure, but it was used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. A span, which is also called a cubit, I didn't know that until this week in the Bible, measures the, the length of space between an adult man's elbow and the tip of his middle finger. Or about the length of a newborn baby. As incomprehensible as it might be, all of God's love and power was contracted into the span of a human infant. And that's, that's difficult for us to get our heads around. Even Jesus' own disciples struggled with it. These were the people that were with him for three years. In John 14, same, same gospel we're reading in today. Uh, Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. You can almost hear the frustration in his voice. Just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus responds with these words. Have you been with me all this time, Philip? And you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. As I said a few weeks ago, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. There's the Father. If you want to know what's important to God, listen to Jesus. If you want to be like God, follow Jesus. That simple. Jesus is the incarnation of the living God. Or as we sometimes say, like Father, like Son. Our job as Jesus' disciples is to keep that love flowing. Our job is to reincarnate that love in everything that we do. In other words, to know us is to know Jesus is to know God. See how that works? How that's supposed to work? Know us, know Jesus, know God. Reminds me of uh, one of my favorite television commercials. I know you've seen them because they're on TV constantly. Uh, about the consultant who does workshops for uh, young homeowners who are afraid of becoming their parents. I know you've seen these. Uh, and I have to admit, every time I see one of these commercials, I feel seen. So whether it's printing off my airplane ticket or you know, telling dumb dad jokes or, or getting a, trying to find a, a place close to the exit when I go to you know, wherever there's a big crowd... That's me. I've become my parents. And my kids will probably do the same. Getting older and becoming more like our parents, and I think that's part of the joke here, is, is it's usually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's usually a good thing. It might be a little cringy at times, but it's usually a good thing. For instance, those of us who are fortunate enough to live a long time, we often get better at expressing love. Not always, but a lot of times we do. 
some of that stuff that seemed so important to us when we were younger, that got in the way of that, just doesn't seem as important as it did before. What does seem important, though, is love. As, as James, Taylor, James Taylor sings in one of my all-time favorite songs, shower the people you love with love. Show them the way you feel. Things are going to work out fine if you only will. A lot of truth in that. Now, in my experience, women seem to figure this out more quickly than men do. But men, a lot of times, will eventually figure this out. I've seen it again and again. Guys that were tough, maybe even a little scary when they were younger, suddenly find themselves saying, I love you. Maybe even putting heart emojis in their texts, you know, uh, to their kids and their grandkids. And the fact that they're even texting got, has to tell you something, right? If they're even willing to do that. In other words, we start acting more and more like our Heavenly Father. It happens, or at least it should. Love came down at Christmas. The question is, will we allow God's love to grow in us or not? Will we incarnate God's love in all that we do? And John gives us a pretty good hint as, as to how that happens in our scripture reading. And it doesn't happen by accident. Most things don't. Jesus came as a light into the darkness. That's what he said. Some loved the light and some rejected it. But John writes, to all who received him and who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. And we know what happens with children, right? They become their parents. 200 years ago, at the beginning of the, of the Christian church, the movement out of which this church came, the leaders of that movement had a slogan. It's still my favorite. They went, in essentials, unity. There's that word unity. It just occurred to me again. Oneness. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty, freedom. In all things, charity. And of course, that's an old-fashioned word for love. The one essential that we identified way back then is Jesus. That's why when a, a person comes forward on a Sunday morning, I only ask one question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And do you accept Him as your personal Lord and Savior? That's the one essential. The one. The non-essentials are all the other things we have to figure out. Many of them are really, really important about all kinds of things. But as the slogan says, in all things we are people of love. All things. That's who we are. Unfortunately, when it comes to the non-essentials, I think a lot of us would rather be right than loving. A lot of us would rather score points against our ideological or political enemies then act like children of our Heavenly Father. Approaching all things in love doesn't mean that we give sin a pass. Doesn't mean that we surrender to the darkness or to injustice or to anything else. The world in which we live is messed up, okay? That's a given. It has been from the beginning. But God didn't send his world into the world, in, didn't send his son into the world to condemn it. That's verse 17, right? John 3, 16. That's verse 17. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it, for God so loved this messed up world. And guess what? He calls us to do the same. I'm going to finish today with a reading from one of John's letters. Because John loved to talk about love. We see that in his gospel. We really see it in those three letters of his at the end of the new, near the end of the New Testament. And, uh, and he says it better than I ever could. So we're gonna, I'm going to read now from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, where he writes, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. 
In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. In other words, when we do that, we become more and more like our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come to you from the midst of a fallen world, a broken world. Not only is it a place where tragedies happen, where we're reminded of, of exactly how fragile and vulnerable we are, but we also come to you from a world where we get caught up in darkness, where we find ourselves lashing out in, in anger, when we find ourselves pitted against brothers and, and sisters, sometimes even in our own families. Help us. Help us to love like you love us, even in our sin, even in our brokenness. Help us to forgive even as you have forgiven us. Bless us as we seek to become more and more like your son. For we pray this all in his name. Amen.